thoughtful people, intelligent people, have been fascinated, intrigued by the question of how did the world begin? Scientists, philosophers, trying to figure out how did it all start? There are different theories, there are different beliefs. None of them are very satisfying. Even the ones that are true. For example, there is this explanation of uh, how the world began is that the Creator has a royal uh, part to his character. He is a king, and a king has to have subjects. Ein melech b'loy am. There is no king without a people. You can't be king over yourself. So in order to be a king, God created the world. So it all began with this royal or sovereign impulse. Another explanation is God is essentially good, the essence of goodness, and it is the nature of goodness to do good. In other words, goodness demands expression. If you're a good person, you're not content with feeling good. You want to go out and do good. So God created the world so that he could do good for his creations. There are other more esoteric explanations. Of course, there's the theory of evolution. The world evolved from some stuff. There was a big bang. None of these really answer the question. Because if we understand the question properly, it is a really good question. How did the world begin? Say, so, well, there was a creator. Understand what we're saying. There was a creator means something existed without being created. An eternal being. A substance that was always. Okay? It's a good assumption. If everything we see was created, well, then there's got to be something that was not created, which is the source of all of this stuff that came into being after not being. All right. The problem is, if there is an eternal being that always was and didn't need to be created, then where did creation come from? See, now the question is much deeper and much bigger. You can't tell me God created the world out of kindness. Kindness is part of the creation. You can't tell me he created the world because he felt like a king. That comes as part of creation. In the beginning, there was just him. Just him means no love, no kindness, no royalty, no sovereignty. Those are all created things. So, in the beginning there was an infinite, eternal something. And then what happened? So the question of the origins of the universe is really quite a religious question. Since there was only God at the beginning, what appealed to God that made him create the world? What consideration did he have that motivated creation? There was nothing, just him. Kindness is not eternal. 
royalty is not eternal. And if you want to avoid the word God, and you want to say it all began in a subatomic particle, that subatomic particle always existed. It is eternal. So it exists forever, and then it explodes. <laughs> Why? Not how. Why? There's only that particle. So what? It didn't change for an eternity. And then suddenly, in the middle of this e eternity, whatever that means, all of a sudden, it explodes. So you have to assume that there was something else with which it collided. Oh, so now you have two eternal beings, which doesn't make any sense at all. You can't have two infinities. You can't have two infinities, because if there are two, it means that one ends and the other one begins. So this one has an end and this one has a beginning. They're both not infinite. So the question of how did the universe begin is a very good question. And there's only one acceptable answer. The one acceptable answer is that in this supreme being, in this eternal being, there was an internal combustion. There was nothing besides him that motivated him, it would have to be an internal process. There was something about him, because only him existed. How do we describe that? So here's, here's the important point. When we say there's a creator, when we say there's an original being, from which all other beings derive, what we're saying is that this is a fully developed, infinitely developed being, not a featureless being. See, we, we, we assume that if you want to get back to the creator, to the original substance, you have to remove all features. There can be no features. He can't be a body, he can't have a, arms, legs, eyes. He can't be finite, he can't be described, he can't be limited in any way. The result is God's existence is a featureless one. So you can either say, well, God is everything, or you can say he's nothing and it will mean the same thing. A featureless God is not the God of Judaism, and is not the God of Torah. The first thing God tells us as a people at Mount Sinai, God says, I am God your God, you shall have no other gods, and don't take my name in vain, I am a jealous God. Featureless? So how do we understand this? God loves. But is God love? Well, if, if, if he doesn't love, then why would we love him? How do we have a relationship with him? If he doesn't love, then what is he? If he does love, well, then he's finite. Because love is not infinite and love is not eternal. So what gives? So to understand it properly, we have to, we have to unlearn everything we assume we know about reality. Because we have to go from nothing to something. 
that takes a lot of brain power because it is truly abstract thinking. There are no visual aids for this. You really have to use intelligence. See, the theory of evolution, you can visualize. There was this tiny little thing and it exploded. That's not, that's not abstract. So here, here's how the picture should look. What does it mean that God is infinite? It doesn't mean that he's very big. Big is itself a finite description. He's very big, still finite. Even infinitely big. Infinitely big means he's infinite in one thing, in bigness, in magnitude. You can't say that about God. Why can't we attribute any finite uh, characteristic to God? Because all, all limitation, any finiteness, is imposed. A stronger force can impose a limit on a weaker force. Something big can make something small feel small. But if God is God, the original being, then there was no force that could limit or place finite conditions on the Creator. So no limit can be attributed to the original being because that would imply that there was a stronger original being and we really should be talking about that not about this. So if there is a limit on God, any limit whatsoever, I want to know who put that limit there because whoever can limit God is even more impressive than God. Kryptonite is more impressive than Superman. So we're starting off with a being that has no limits whatsoever. And that's why you cannot say that he, is, that he is a body. You can't say he has eyes or ears or hands or feet. True enough. But now let's turn it around. If God is truly without limit, and if you cannot place any limits on him, then how can you say he does not have a, eyes or a mouth or hands? Who would prevent him from having eyes? Who would prevent him from having a mouth? So how do we make sense of this? If he is truly infinite, then he is not physical and he doesn't have a mouth. But if he is truly infinite, why won't he have a mouth? If he wants to have a mouth, he has a mouth. Who's going to start him? Who's going to stop him? So here's how it works. A human being has a mouth, but he's limited by it. The human being can speak only through his mouth. And he did not invent his own mouth, he didn't choose to have a mouth, and he can't not have a mouth. When we speak about God's mouth, God's speech, God said, let there be light, we're not talking about a mouth that he is limited by or a mouth that dictates how he speaks and what it sounds like and so on. The opposite. It is because he is missing nothing, he has a mouth too. But that's because he's limitless, not because he's limited 
to a mouth or ears or eyes. So when we say God is not finite and God is not a body, we mean he's not limited by it. There's no body that dictates God's behavior. God dictates his own behavior, and if he wants to behave by using a mouth, he uses a mouth. So God does have a mouth, but not like ours. Which one is more real? His. So, how did the world begin? The world began because God is not featureless. God is all-inclusive. And that's news. That's revelation. God had to come down to Mount Sinai and give us the Torah to tell us that he is not what we think he is. Because we think he's featureless. We think he is indescribable, unknowable, and so on, and therefore uh, not much to speak about. So God comes and gives us his Torah. And in the Torah, he tells us all about himself. And he is not featureless. He prefers certain animals because they are acceptable to him as food for the human being, and other animals are not. The laws of Kashrut. To him, certain days are holier than other days in his creation. And so you have Shabbat and Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah and all the other holidays. So God is not featureless. Not because he is limited by those things, but because he is free to be those things if he so chooses. It's all volitional. So what is it that made God create the world? What is it that made God create the world? There was no it. What about the world was so appealing that God wanted to create it? Absolutely nothing. There was no world to be appealing. There was nothing. There was only him. Therefore, his motivation for creating the world has to be himself, because that's all there was. He himself motivated himself to create the world. Internal combustion. The best word that we can find f to describe this is desire, passion. God has a passion for the creation that he, that he produced. Why do we use the word passion? Because on the one hand, we know what passion is. On the other hand, we have no idea where it comes from. Why do we have certain passions? We don't know. Not that we can't figure it out. There is no why to a passion. Meaning, passion is essentially you. Not something you acquire. Not something you learn. Not something you inherit. So it's neither nature or nurture. It is essential to the person, to the being. And so when we want to say what motivated God to create the world, what we're trying to say is he motivated himself. Not the world appealed to him. He desires the world. There's something about him that makes the world exist, not something about the world that makes it exist. And that's why we can transcend the world. We can transcend nature. 
we don't have to live by the dictates of nature. Because nature is not the reality. The reality is the desire that God has for nature. But the desire comes from him, not from nature. And that's why before nature existed, God already had a desire for it. And that's what it means. Not by bread alone does man live, but by the word of God. Meaning, the word of God in the bread is what gives life, not the bread itself. What is the word of God that gives life that is in the bread? The word of God with which he created the bread. Meaning the word that expresses his desire. That's where life comes from. From God's desire that life should exist. What caused that desire? Nothing. That's just him. The better we understand this, the closer we get to him. To use, to use a somewhat helpful example. When does a woman become a mother? When she conceives? When she gives birth? When she marries off her child? <laughs> when does she become a mother? Essentially, from the minute she's born. She's already a mother. Now you just have to find a child. A mother is a mother before there's a child. A mother loves her child before there's a child. There is something about a woman that makes her a mother, not the child. God is already God before there's a creation. That's what we call a passion, a desire. You can have a desire that comes purely from yourself, not in reaction to anything outside yourself. That's why the theory of evolution cannot work. You cannot have a physical object, no matter how tiny, no matter how awesome, no matter how powerful. You cannot have a physical object that began the process. Because a physical object does not have a passion. There's no internal combustion. And so that object will depend on the existence of another object to get anything started. So when we say God created the world, what we mean is there is a being who has a will of his own, a desire of his own, a passion of his own, and it is that passion that creates the world. When he creates the world, he created love, and he created kindness, and he created compassion. Those are all created entities. So he used kindness to design the world. He used justice to give the world uh, some structure, some backbone. These are all tools. So is he kind? Yes. Does kindness dictate his behavior? No. The only thing that dictates his behavior is himself. He is truly a free agent. We are not necessarily that way. Very hard to find something that a human being wants without external in, in interference or influence. You happen to like this particular color. It's your favorite color. When did you decide that this should be your favorite color? Uh, you didn't decide. 
You can't help it. That's your favorite color. What are you going to do about it? So there's no volition there, which means this color has a certain effect on you, and therefore you're drawn to it. So it's almost like it chooses you, not you choose it. Like a child walking into a toy store, and all of a sudden he very much needs that toy which he never saw before. So where does that need coming from? Not the child. It's coming from the toy. The toy is having that effect on the child. Even the desire to live, our survival instinct, is not, is not a choice. That's how we're designed. We can even transcend that. We don't have to live. It is non-essential to us. Whereas with God, God is not featureless. But now let's understand. If kindness is something he created, then what are the features of him? What is it that he does desire internally, essentially, absolutely? Meaning, the desire is eternal. What is it that he always wanted and will always want? The answer is a relationship with his people. Didn't create the world for blue skies and green lawns and white picket fences. He created the world for the people living in those homes that have a lawn with a white picket fence. The essential, eternal, um, absolutely necessary feature of God is the desire to not be the only thing. So now we can, uh, we can describe God this way. God's being is exclusive. Only he exists. Nothing else exists. He's God. But this existing being that exists to the exclusion of all other beings doesn't like it and does not want to remain exclusive. And so he creates human beings with freedom of choice. Now he's not the only being. That's called a relationship. He gives these human beings freedom of choice because he doesn't want to be the only. The solution to that is to have beings that can either accept him or reject him. That comes from freedom of choice. So, the world began with an internal, essential passion that God has for a relationship. To have someone besides him. The rest is commentary. So we can spend an eternity figuring out why the commentary of creation is what it is. Why a sky? Why an earth? Why round? Why green? Why blue? Why kindness? Why compassion? These are all stuff that God created. Why? What's it all for? But that's what we call godliness figuring out what is the godly function of blue, of sky. What is the godly function of grass? 
what is the godly function of air? It needs explanation because none of these things exist by their own right. Only God exists by his own right. So we don't ask, why does God exist? We ask, why did he create these things and make them exist? Because they exist only for a purpose, not essentially. This makes the picture of God and creation a little more tangible, a little more knowable. We have a vocabulary with which to discuss creation, which takes us from nothingness to everythingness. That is brilliance. That's what we need real intelligence for. Where do we find this in the Torah? We find it in the teachings of Hasidus. It came late in history because it is the final um, unfolding of the, the petals of Torah that unfold gradually, and the closer you get to the core of the flower, the later that layer develops. It develops from within. So the most recent petals are coming from the, most, from the deepest part of the flower. So Torah, like a flower, unfolds petal after petal, row after row, becoming more and more intimate, more and more and more revealing of God himself. So the first layer, the most external layer, is what is God like and what does he dislike? Not very personal, just factual. Those are the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. And then, in stages, the Torah reveals more and more of the creator, of the author of the Torah. And now, at this point in history, we have access to the deepest part of Torah, which is the most intimate part of Torah, that describes God himself more than any previous layers of revelation. Of course, when Mashiach comes, that's going to be a whole different story. Then the closeness with God will be unimaginable. You have to wait to see it. So what does that do for us? Number one, it makes eternity more real. The thought of living forever, permanence, more believable, more accessible. It makes the ability to survive what seems impossible by the law of nature. We can transcend that. The law of nature is not the final word. Some things are essential to the Creator. They are forever. The commentary stuff, they might be temporary. So what is essential to the Creator? The relationship with His people and His relationship with Torah. Every mitzvah in the Torah is eternal like God is eternal. So when we say God is not featureless, it means God always preferred Shabbos. 
God always preferred the mitzvah. It's not like God created the world. There are many people in this world. Some people are poor. Some people are rich. So God commands the rich to give charity to the poor. No, the commandment didn't come in response to creation. Creation was designed to match the mitzvah. So because God always wanted charity, tzedakah, that's why he created some people rich, some people poor. Because God always wanted Shabbos, that's why he created the world in the six days and gave Shabbos its prominence. So the world is created according to the mitzvah. The mitzvah is not in response to the world. And that's why as God is eternal, the Torah is eternal. It always was and it always will be. When did we know about it? When did we learn about it? When was it handed over to us? 3,333 years ago at Mount Sinai. But what was handed over to us? That which is essential to God. It is as eternal as God. It is, it is as infinite as God. But human beings are privileged, gifted, with the ability to tap into that which is eternal and infinite by doing the mitzvah. It's obvious that this needs more explanation, more detail, and so on. Seven generations of Chabad Rebbes added, explained, elucidated, until it became a really knowable study. So yes, there is much more to study, there's much more to know. But that's basically the outline. That is the story of creation. Shalom Aleichem. How are you? You know, I do a lot of talking, a lot of Zooming, many classes, many subjects. But that's all formal stuff. Hopefully good stuff, but formal. We also have a Wednesday night meeting that's more informal and kind of um, Hamish. If you want to join us for that kind of an event, um, interactive, time for questions and so on, if you want to join us for this side of conversation, click on the link below and join us every Wednesday night at nine o'clock well, maybe not every Wednesday night, but we try to make it every Wednesday night at nine o'clock, a more informal chat, which uh, can be more enjoyable at times than the formal stuff. So check it out. Click on the link and join us. Try it. You'll like it. <laughs>